Daniel chapter 1, we know that Daniel was about 16 years of age. By the time you come to Daniel chapter 9, Daniel's in his mid-80s. So when you're reading chapters, sometimes it seems like it's bang, 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 bang. But it's a long time that's, that's taking place as God is preparing Daniel. And it had been several years since the vision of chapter 8. Remember, Gabriel comes to Daniel and starts to explain the 2300 prophecy to Daniel. You remember what Daniel did? He fainted and got sick. And so Gabriel had to wait for him to get over. And he comes back in chapter 9 and begins to explain the 2300 day prophecy. Now I know for a lot of people that's a confusing prophecy. But you know, if you keep it simple, Daniel's looking forward and we're looking back. God is telling Daniel, About the ministry of Jesus, about his sacrifice on the cross, about the gospel going to the Gentiles, and about the message to be preached, three angels' message being preached in the beginning of 1844, about the judgment, about the cleansing of the sanctuary. There is a lot of confusion out there, and I've talked to a variety of people, and there is an incredible amount of confusion. And yet it's so simple. So we're going to break this down about six sections. But from the time of chapter 8 to chapter 9, Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, had asked Daniel to come to, to tell him what this handwriting on the wall is all about. Before you know it, Belshazzar is executed by the means of the Persians and the Persian, the Medo-Persian Empire becomes the number one world empire. And Daniel becomes one of the three presidents who oversaw all the administration of the Medo-Persian Empire. In fact, he became number one. Of course, that ends up, ends up in the lion's den as a result of that. In verses 1 and 2, Daniel tells us that he is studying the prophecies of Jeremiah. Now, I don't know if he went down to Kinko's and got a copy made or what he did, but he begins to realize that the 70 years of captivity that, Dan, that Jeremiah has been talking about are about to come to an end. And Daniel is excited until Gabriel comes along and says, by the way, this whole prophecy is 2300 years long. Wouldn't you get sick if you were expecting something to happen and then say you're told it's going to be 2,300 more years? And Daniel got really sick. He was, he was thinking about what it would be like to go back to Jerusalem and to worship in the new temple. That wasn't going to happen. And he was heartbroken. And so Daniel begins to pray. It's one of the two most powerful prayers recorded in Scripture. This is 4 through 19. Daniel begins to pray. And you know what's unique about that prayer? Is he doesn't use the word them or those. He says us and we. Amen. We have all sinned. Now sometimes it's easy to say, well, the problem with the church, Daniel says, when we say that, we should say the problem with the church is me. That's what Daniel did. He said, the problem of this open rebellion that God is having to deal with us. I'm part of it. And he, and he prays this amazing prayer where he gives glory to God and he acknowledges the sin of his people. And he's, he's a lot like Jacob, clinging, clinging to God's promises. Notice what in verse 8 of chapter 9. He says, O oh Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. In verse 16 through 17, O oh Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech you, 
Let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from the city of Jerusalem, the holy mountain. Because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. And verse 17, now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. Daniel is telling us what an amazing and awesome God is we serve, who longs for us to be transformed by his power. And then in verse 24, Gabriel comes back. Verses 20 through 23, Daniel says, I'm going to explain this to you. Verse 24 says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Verse 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war, desolations are determined. In verse 27, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring to an end sacrifice and offerings, and on the wing of abominations shall one who make desolate even until the consummation which is determined and poured out on the desolate. You know, what's, what's encouraging with this prophecy is that God gives us the keys to unlock it. He tells us that in Ezra and in, in Numbers that a day in prophecy is equal to a year. So when Daniel may have first heard the 2300, he was saying, well, that's not so bad, until he realized, oh, you're talking 2300 years. It's a day for a year. And, and we know that principle works because as you follow this prophecy, Every detail falls in place just as God prophesied. Amen. Daniel looks forward with hope, and we can look back with amazement at how precise God is. So let's break it into six sections. Beginning with the 70 weeks of Daniel 9, 24. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. For the year day principle, how many years is 70 weeks? 490. God gave the children of Israel 490 years to get it right. To surrender themselves, to be his ambassadors, to preach to the world about Christ and his righteousness. 490. Would you give them that much time? Would you be that gracious? I don't know that I would be, but God set aside in this prophecy 490 years. God wanted to bring reconciliation, not only to the Jewish people, but for the Jewish people to be his ambassadors of reconciliation to all the world. So let's go to the second part. Daniel 9, 25. Know therefore and understand. So Daniel begins to explain that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Now there were three different decrees given to restore Jerusalem. And Ezra records them for us. Cyrus gave a decree in 538 BC allowing the Jews to return from their exile. You know, there were millions and millions of Jews in exile. Only about 50,000 left. Really a drop in the bucket compared to as many. In fact, Ezra 
when, when they saw the crowd that was coming, he had to go back and talk to the Levites and said, we need you as the spiritual leaders. And I don't know if he had the twist in the arms, but he desperately needed more Levites to come and join them. And we're told that they returned with the vessels that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple. 50,000 exiles <coughs> returned to Jerusalem. Then you have Darius the first, or known as Darius the Great. He gave the second decree in 519 BC, which was a confirmation of Cyrus's decree. But then the most important one, the final one, was Artaxerxes. And that gave Jerusalem legal standing. That authorized them to be a country. And that happened in 457 B.C. So we know the beginning date of this prophecy. 457 B.C. When Jerusalem became an official country. So Ezra tells us that we needed all three of these decrees to understand what was going on and to understand the beginning of the prophecy. The third event, you all with me so far? Mm -hmm. Until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two. So what is seven plus sixty-two? 69. You're doing great here. Doing great. So how many years is 69? Very good. Very good. I had to look it up. 483 years. So from 457, 483 years brings us to A.D. 27. Now he said in verse 25, until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. Now, if you hold your finger to nine, Daniel nine, and then flip over to Luke chapter three. Luke establishes an important date for us. Luke chapter 3, verse 1. Luke says, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, and we know from history Tiberius Caesar was the Caesar in A.D. 27. Luke continues in chapter 3. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heavens was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. And Jesus himself began his ministry at about 33 years of age. So Gabriel is telling Daniel, And in 69 weeks, the Messiah will begin his ministry. And it happened exactly as Gabriel had prophesied. And exactly, Jesus appeared on the scene right when he was supposed to. Now we look at this, you know, that, that happened. Daniel was looking for his hope. Nobody but Jesus of Nazareth fulfills this prophecy. A lot of people try to throw other names in there, but only Jesus fulfills this. Now let's look at the fourth. The Messiah was cut off. So following verse 26, the details of what would happen after the 483 years. After the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So he tells us the Messiah would be cut off and the temple would be destroyed after the 483 years. 
Now it didn't say that the temple would be destroyed within the 490 years, but it said after the 483, the temple would be destroyed. In fact, Jesus was having a discussion with the Pharisees about the temple. And he said, it's going to be destroyed. And he says, in Matthew 24, 2, he says, and not one stone will be left upon another. Well, the Pharisees couldn't handle that. And secular history tells us that the Roman general Titus destroyed both the city and the temple in AD 70, after the 62 weeks, just as prophecy had foretold. Everything's right on dot. Let's look at the fifth, Daniel 9.26. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. So the 483 ended in AD 27 at the baptism of Jesus, at the time that the Holy Spirit descends and Jesus begins his ministry. Which also means that the Jews had only one week or seven years left. 27 AD. From 27 AD. Thank you. So if you take seven years, and you add it to 27, what do you get? 34 AD. And what happened in 34 AD? Stephen was stoned. Pardon? Stephen was stoned. Stephen was stoned. The gospel will now begin going to the Gentiles. But the tragedy is the gospel is taken away from the Jewish nation. You know, they they revolt. I mean, they, they they do this terrible tragedy against Stephen. Here, Paul says it's not important that you're born Jewish. It's important that you are spiritual Israelites. What happened when Jesus breathed his last breath on the cross? What happened to the temple? Anybody remember? Yeah, the temple was ripped apart. The service was ended. The presence of God was no longer in the most holy place. The, the earthly sanctuary ended. But the good news is the heavenly sanctuary did not end, but the earthly one came to an end when Jesus breathed his last breath. And the Holy Spirit, the disciples were in the upper room poured out upon the disciples and they began their ministry. You know, this final three and a half years of the 70 week portion of the 2300 days prophecy ended with this act of defiance in AD 34. When the, when the Jewish leaders stoned Stephen for reminding them that for 490 years they had been in rebellion. And God was calling them for renewal and for, for repentance. Remember when Jesus preached on the day of Pentecost and the people said, what must we do to be saved? And what did he say? Repent and be baptized. For 490 years they've been hearing that message and they've been ignoring it. The scripture is clear that the Jewish nation was to be a light to the Gentile world, but they weren't. In Acts 13 says, then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God to be spoken to the Jews first, but since you rejected it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to who? Gentiles. To the Gentiles. And what is a Gentile? You know, when I first went to church, it was a little Baptist church in Bethel, Florida. Maybe you probably know where Bethel is. I've driven through it many times. And I heard this Baptist preacher talk about Gentiles, and I said, well, I don't know what they are, but I don't want to be one. <laughs> you all know what a Gentile is? Anybody who's not Jewish. Do you know what a barbarian is? So we get the word barber. Barbarians are non-Romans. Sometimes we have these exclusive words. 
In Acts 22, Jesus said, Depart, for I send you to the Gentiles. Now in Acts chapter 10, there's another significant movement that takes place. Now most of the world thinks Acts chapter 10 is about clean and unclean meat. What does Peter see in this net? He sees a bunch of animals, doesn't he? He sees, he calls them four-legged creatures. Sometimes we, in our minds, say, well, they must be, you know, like pigs and camels, and we think of all these unclean animals. But the rabbis taught that if a clean animal came in contact with an unclean animal, that clean animal became unclean. So Peter is seeing both clean and unclean animals. He knows the tradition, the teaching that rabbis had, and so he says to God, I don't eat that kind of stuff. I don't eat clean animals that have been associated with unclean, and I don't eat, eat unclean animals. He says, verse 14 of chapter 10 says, I have never ever eaten unclean. Well, that's good, isn't it? Unfortunately, he missed the point of the message until God saved Cornelius. That's what Peter says in Acts 10, 28. Then he said, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to another, another nation, but God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. We are all children of God. Amen. These events occurred after AD 34, in which the gospel went to the Gentiles. Now, Peter needed a few more lessons. Remember, Peter, remember Paul had to confront Peter and say, what is the story here? In verse 27, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, it says, On the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. So less than 40 years into AD 70, the pagan Roman army would make the temple and the city of Jerusalem desolate. Until the consummation of all things at the time determined. Now some people try to say, well, Antioch's Epiphanes who stopped the sanctuary service and who sacrificed pigs in the temple, that he's the one who did that. But when the, when the Roman armies appeared outside the city of Jerusalem, they brought with them their banners, the banners that represented the gods that they served. That is the abomination of desolation that Jesus talks about in the New Testament. Amen. And then to complete the prophecy, Daniel, Eight, verse 14, which Gabriel introduced this whole thing, says 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now remember, William Miller thought this was the earthly sanctuary that was being cleansed. And he was preaching that Jesus is coming when? 1844. Because it was time for the sanctuary. So if you subtract 490 years from 2,300, how many years do you have left? Good. 1,810 years left after the 490. Then, Gabriel says, the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Gabriel's not talking about the temple in Jerusalem because it doesn't exist anymore. How can you cleanse something that doesn't exist? But the book of Hebrews and the book of Revelation makes it very clear to us that there is a sanctuary in heaven. And that the one on earth was only a pattern of a sanctuary not made by man's hands. And the high priest went into the most holy place once a year. They called it the Day of Atonement. And he would take blood from the sacrificial goat and make his way through the first part of the temple, 
the holy place. Part the inner veil which separated the two, the two um, sections of the temple. And he would get into the most holy place. Then he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, confessing and asking forgiveness for the sins of Israel committed during that year. And that was the day of judgment. That was the, the day of cleansing of the earthly sanctuary. Jesus Christ is in the most heavenly sanctuary as our high priest. And he is representing us before the Heavenly Father. Chapter 7 of Daniel pictures the cleansing of the sanctuary. It says in chapter 7, right, which is 9 through 10, just with paraphrase here. I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. And he goes on in verse 10, it says, the court was seated and the books were open. What's written in, what's written in the book about you? About me? Verse 13, he says, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. In verse 22, he came to the Ancient of Days and the judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. Amen. Isn't that encouraging? Amen. Judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. As I told you before, when we appear before God, our names are in the books, we are found guilty. But we are declared